Hello everyone and welcome back to English with Kaylee. In today's video I'm going to be taking a look at a, a highly requested video actually, um, looking at Jackie Kay's In the Seventh Year poem. Um, it's, it's a beautiful poem, it's very very short. Um, so what I'm going to do is first of all I'm going to give some context to the poem and there's a few things we need to understand before we get into it. Then we'll read it and we'll take a look at an analysis of it. Um, and then we'll take a look at a, you know, a potential theory that you could use um, if you were doing the GCSE A-level syllabus. So In the Seventh Year appears in Kay's Severe Gale 8 collection, uh, which was released in 1991. And if you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know a little bit about the collection. Um, but very briefly, it is a more personal and social commentary on life um, in Britain in the 1990s and 1980s. Um, and if you go back and watch some of my other videos about poems from the collection, I'm sure that you'll be able to see several links between them. So the poem is one of two which is written for Louise, um, the first being in the seventh year and the latter being photo in the locket. If you do have the Darling Anthology, which I hope and suggest you get if you're studying uh, from the collection for your A-level exams, um, and I, I really suggest that you go and you read Photo in the Locket. It's a particularly long poem, it's a dense poem, um, but definitely something we can mention when discussing in the seventh year. So Photo in the Locket explores an interracial lesbian relationship, and given the fact that they're both dedicated to the same person, it is possible that the same relationship could be applied to in the seventh year. This, of course, makes sense given our knowledge of Kay's own sexual orientation and her stance on LGBT plus rights and other social commentaries in Sevilla Gale 8. Now, this is a romantic poem and it employs characteristics of romanticism poetry that peaked in the 1800s. So this was a poetic movement of the late 18th and early 19th centuries that turned towards nature and the interior world of feeling. Now we know that nature is very much characteristic of Kay's work. We see her discuss a relationship through nature in a way from you. We see her exploring um, a young person's uh, imaginary friendship. Um, in Brendan Gallagher and she uses nature as a moment of total freedom and happiness. Um, so we can already attribute this as something that Kay greatly interacts with within her works. And then we get this interior world of feeling. Now as we know feelings are often complex, they're not something that often have much logic to it um, and because of that this poem can be quite difficult to unpack, um, but I think if you take a step back and appreciate it for what it is, um, it's a very creative, beautiful piece. So English poets such as William Wordsworth, John Keats, William Blake and Lord Byron produced work that expressed spontaneous feelings that found parallels to their own emotional lives in the natural world. Um, and I really do feel that is what we're seeing here. So we're looking at, you know, an, an emotion, a relationship, um, and possibly, it possibly is looking at Kay's life herself, um, but at least of the speaker in the natural world. And I think this bit is very important, that it celebrates creativity rather than logic. Um, as I said, when we look at feelings and emotions, it can often be quite difficult to unpack to unpack but the purpose of this poem is, is for creativity and celebration of love. Okay <clears throat> so let's read the poem before we get into our analysis. So in the seventh year for Louise. Our sea is still mysterious as morning mist, its flapping arms stretched out for dry sand its running heels sliding over pebbles when the sun dives in at night. We're turquoise and clear some days, still as breeze, others stormy like stones. You are in deep stroking my bones, my love an ache. The early light spreading the water, seven years, seven years 
I repeat over and over, clasping this timeless, this changing thing. So, beautiful poem, quite a difficult read considering there isn't very much punctuation at all, and so by the time you get to the end you're almost gasping for breath yourself, um, which really mimics and, and goes hand in hand uh, with this relationship, this morning mist, something that's continuous, it's continuing, it's developing, um, and, and so the, the, the structure of the poem really reflects that. Okay, so we can say that this is called a lyric poem, okay, lyric poetry, and that is a brief emotive poem written in first person. It emphasises sound and pictorial imagery rather than narrative or dramatic movement. We are quite used to seeing Kate use narratives in her poems, um, stemming from her not only being a poet but being a playwright and a novelist. Um, so this one's quite different for her. Um, so the very first thing is that we see this in the seventh year. Um, <clears throat> upon reading it, we, we, you know, we start to question why the seventh year? Um, there's an, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, the seventh year of marriage or the seventh year of a relationship um, is almost the deal breaker. Um, this can be the, the difficult time when people are, uh, when people start to evaluate their relationship and, you know, the direction. Um, but upon reading it, we don't get a sense that there's this overly negative feeling between the two within the couple. And this is really emphasised by the fact that stanza one and stanza two, they both start with this collective pronoun. We see unity, we see love, togetherness, our, we. There doesn't seem to be a separation of the individuals. They are very much one. <clears throat> Our sea is still mysterious as morning mist. Um, it was actually one of my students who pointed this one out. Um, so thank you, Nicole. Um, so the use of this adverb here really suggests that, you know, their relationship has been mysterious, but it is still ambiguous. So there are still things that they are trying to learn about each other or learn about the relationship. Then we have this lovely consonant sound, okay, the M sound, the mysterious morning mist. Um, and of course, mist creates an idea of the, the unknown, um, but it also creates a very beautiful scene, um, especially as the mist rises and lifts and we get this clearing. And then we see an array of verbs, um, flapping, running, sliding, stroking, spreading, clasping, changing. Again, this is really emphasizing the sound and the images that it creates for the reader. Um, <clears throat> the volume of verbs, it really goes hand in hand with the movement of the sea, which we see throughout the poem, the extended metaphor of the ocean and how it almost reflects their relationship. So the volume of verbs and the fact that it's in the continuous form shows this almost flowing of the water and the development of their relationship as well. Then we have a rhyme here, so right in the middle of the poem. Um, I've actually, I'm just realising this as I'm kind of talking through it, but if we look at the poem as a whole, we have this rhyming couplet which is right in the middle um, of the three stanzas, almost as if showing the unity between the two characters. Um, and we have this full rhyme, stones and bones, but what's very interesting is it very much, it's very juxtaposing. Stones are there for strength, they're sturdy, unbreakable, and then we have bones, stroking my bones, so we see this fragility um, and of the speaker's partner consoling, stroking, protecting, caring for the speaker. So 
does it almost symbolize their personalities and their role within the relationship? Um, which is an, an interesting take um, on the fact that these two particular, these two rhyming sentences are right in the middle of the poem. My love and ache. Um, I had a very interesting conversation with my students on this one. Um, because of course, when we see an ache, an ache often connotes a dull pain, something that isn't going away. But if we look at the, the, the word order, the structure of the sentence, if you say, you know, I ache for something, that would be a strong desire for someone or something. Um, but then on the other hand, given the sentence structure, there's also pain there, an ache, a pain, but an ache can also be linked to a very positive feeling of desire, of want. Um, does the partner want and crave the love from the other? So throughout the poem, as we've said, nature plays a huge role within, within the story um, and within the emotion being expressed. So we see this extended metaphor, the sea is their relationship. And sometimes it's beautiful, it's turquoise and still as breeze. But then other times we're sliding over pebbles. It's dangerous, okay? It's not, um, it's not solid, it's not calm. And then, as I said, I think that the lack of punctuation as we see, it's just at the end, really, when we have our end stop line. Um, it does create the flow of the river and the natural outpour of emotions that the speaker is expressing. Um, and that is of particular importance when we go back to this is more about the creativity of looking at, at an emotion, looking at a moment, as opposed to looking at a logic or a narrative which we're used to seeing with K. So this one can be, if we look at it within the collection that's um, on the list for the A-level exams, This, I think this is why this one has caused some people some difficulty. So in terms of the theories and the lenses that you could look at this poem through, um, I would suggest that you have a look at the psychoanalytical criticism. Um, so this was obviously employed by Freud and later theorists to interpret texts. Um, and I've highlighted the key bits in blue, which is what I think you could zone in on, on top of also mentioning photo in the locket. You could discuss that it argues that literary texts like dreams express the secret unconscious desires and anxieties of the author. Um, as I said, uh, this was written, this was published in 1991. This was the same year that Jackie Kay met Carol Ann Duffy. Um, of course, they went on to have, you know, a wonderful relationship of 15 years. Um, so is it in relation to that and, and having that new and beautiful relationship or is it also about the anxieties of losing somebody? Um, as I said, I, I couldn't find anything about Louise. If anybody can or anybody has any information, it would be great to share that in the comments with us. And the, the, the other bit I would probably look at is like psychoanalysis itself, this critical endeavor seeks evidence from unresolved emotions, psychological conflicts, guilt, ambivalence and so forth within what may well be a disunified literary work, which we see here. It's quite ambiguous. It doesn't follow a lot of logic. The author's own childhood traumas, family life and sexual conflicts. And I think that's the one that I would look at, given that both poems um, are written for a female and that photo in the locket looks at an interracial couple. Um, so those are the things that I would probably zone in on for the AO5 section. If you can think of any others, be sure to pop them in the comments below. Um, I really hope this video has helped you. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.